welcome. Whenever it is that you are joining, those who are seeing this over YouTube or Facebook, we especially want to extend uh, greetings to the members of Redeemer Lutheran Church, as well as Grace Lutheran Church, friends and visitors. This morning, as we gather together, most of us gathered on the lawn underneath, and I have to admit, a glorious sunny morning that is actually pretty warm out here. Uh, many of us who are gathered here know each other as members of Redeemer, and we're practicing safe distancing, and, and I would encourage you, even after worship, because I know you're going to socialize, but try to maintain some of that safe distance uh, with, with each other. But as we gather, you probably look around and acknowledge most of you. I do on this day because you won't see her very often, but a pastor's wife who I would love taught Sunday school, I would love who would direct the chorus of a church choir, play the organ, but I love it more that she doesn't, is my spouse, Barbara Fortin, and she's over there. So she's down from a call as we do our, um, our monthly provisions, you know, go to Costco and Kmart and everything else, and then head back up to snow country. So she's the one who may not be a familiar face with many of you, but she's the one who gives me permission, to be honest, to be here with you. So thank you, Barbara. But as we gather together, there are a few announcements this morning that I want to cover. Uh, and one is that last week when it was cold, we had conversation with those who gathered about how we move forward during the age of COVID and at the same time, trying to worship together and honor our communities. So the plan is that throughout Pentecost, we'll worship as we are right now. And hopefully we'll have, hopefully we'll be blessed with days, weather like this every Sunday. But on the day, the Sunday we wake up and there's a thunderstorm or some reason the tree falls down, we will be prepared with an online backup piece of worship or teaching. And we will let everybody know that we will not be outside on that day. That's the plan as we gather until Pentecost. There'll be a gathering of all those involved in worship uh, to then probably, if everything goes well, May 8th. Is that correct, Gene? For, For worship conversation. Yes. May 8th. Uh, and then we'll look at what the summer might look like, and then start dreaming about your online presence as you move into the future. So that's, that's coming up. But continue, for those of you who cross your fingers, those who pray, to, to hopefully help us maintain uh, the blessing of this, this beautiful sunshine in this, this space as we gather together. So that's worship. Number two, the call committee. And the reason I'm here is to walk with you during the transition period. The call committee that will lead and coach and support and seek insight from the entire congregation uh, for both, both congregations uh, has started to meet. And you'll hear more for, from them about the process that's involved. Please keep them in your prayers as we move through this process, as the congregation is invited to engage about where God is calling both congregations and then having some clarity about where that might be, then starting to talk to candidates who will be your next regularly called pastor. So that group are present. And if they're present today, one of the readings, the book that we're reading uh, is available on my desk. So those call committee members, if you're present, please raise your hand. We want to identify folks. Connie, others, Calvin, and yeah, so look around, you know each other. Um, keep them in your prayers as we move forward in this ministry. Okay, number three, as we gather, please know that you're still supporting an organization and I've been invited by council to remember, to remind everybody, we still need to have you 
tender, and I don't even know how you do it here, but to continue to tender your regular offerings to support the ministry of the congregation. If you have your envelopes here, I thought we were setting up a basket someplace, right over there. So we're, that's the basket. And then fourthly, today, as we are in Easter, we have, and this is true for all of the, um, the congregations that honor and do the common lectionary. And at this point, you as a community are doing the um, narrative lectionary. So today we have a reminder. It's kind of a counterpoint to Easter. So the real high of Easter, the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, is met today with the reality of what it means to live into that resurrected life. So the reading we'll have is about Stephen. And many of us, from how we experienced the lectionary in the past, we really, we really only heard a couple of paragraphs about that this person was the first martyr identified by the church. Today, there's gonna to be a fuller reading about kind of his background, and you'll hear that. As you do, I invite you to listen and for those of you who have the printed bulletin, as you read along, please note if you have any questions, because as I will do a little homily, a bit of a teaching piece, I would like to first entertain as I'm able some of your questions. For instance, some of you might have a question, what's, what's a Hellenist? What is a Hellenist? Or you might wonder, um, you know, what, what, why is this so exactly parallel to what happened to Jesus in Jerusalem? So the story is still set in Jerusalem, and it's a long reading. So, and oftentimes we don't have long readings because our attention span can't listen that long. But we have a long reading today. And because it's Easter, we begin our time together with the, our Easter refrain. And I'll see if you remember, and I know you do. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We begin with our first hymn. Let us pray. Open for us, O God, the words of the witnesses received by the faithful and handed on to us. Make us free to hear and not hold back that we may live in the joy of Jesus the Christ, the one crucified and risen, who calls us by our name. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the, and the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. 
the number of disciples greatly increased in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freed men, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Cilicia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. They, then they secretly instigated some men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seized him, and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, This man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed on to us. And all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked him, Are these things so? And Stephen replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our ancestor Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Our ancestors had the tent of testimony in the wilderness, as God directed when he spoke to Moses, ordering him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our ancestors. And it was there until the time of David, who found favor with God and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the house of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with human hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is this place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. And now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. As you heard the story, did anything pop into your mind or any questions that you might have? Yes, Jean. I, I'm just amazed that as they were stoning him, he said, Lord, forgive them. Uh-huh. Do not hold this sin against them. You know anybody else who said that when he was hanging from a cross? The last name mentioned in the reading, anybody recognize Saul? And he became Paul. So at this point, Saul, a devout member of the institution, was very supportive of the execution, the stoning of Stephen. That will change. The Hellenist, since you didn't ask any question, I'll just assume you all know what a Hellenist is. Yeah. No. Okay, in the early community, as this is all happening, as, as the author of Acts, which we believe is Luke, the, the writer of Luke, 
this is still all happening at the in the community of where the culture where the power of the people of god the israelites all claim as uh, the center of life in jerusalem and there the hebrews are the ones who spoke the language the hellenists are those who were of the same faith community but they had left the core but had returned and they spoke a different language they spoke greek Aramean. so they were they were both at their roots uh, part of the same faith community but they spoke two different languages i guess in this congregation i don't know what would be a comparison those of us who are christian who speak english and those of us who are christian who speak the language of somalia so they're both together in this community there's a lot going on here and we don't have all of Stephen's speech because it's another 20 or 30 pair or verses. Um, but the reality is, is that this person, Stephen, has for the church been lifted up as the, the first martyr in the new community, the followers of Jesus, what we call the church. Now, <clears throat> as it's Easter, and it's beautiful, and we are members of the first world community. I was going to, and I still will open with this, um, this tune that many of you may know just because of your age. And others of you might hold on to because um, you're a lover of uh, country music. But it's a song that is pretty old now. And the singer has now since died. Her name was Lynn Anderson. And what I want to quote, quote for you is her ver first verse of a song that became quite famous called Rose Garden. I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden. Along with the sunshine, there's got to be a little rain sometime. When you take, you got to give. So live and let go let live or let go i beg your pardon i never promised you a rose garden now i sense the reason the church in its wisdom when it develops and has its its uh, lectionary is to let people know that with the high of easter it's there's more to it than just celebrating the risen one and life is good and all the flowers burst. Easter, beginning of new life. There's more to it as you live it out. And this little verse to me says, you know, there, there's a balance. It's, 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 not, it's not easy. Yet, as I've encouraged you as a congregation, both congregations, during this time of transition to breathe and I didn't use it the last couple Sundays, but this notion about how when we breathe in, we can use that as a breath of what it means to be human, that we share with all of life. When we breathe in, and then when we breathe out, it's about the life we've been invited to live as part of the body of Christ, as Jesus' followers. Breathing in, breathing out. It's a part of who we are as a community, and as individuals, as we live our life in a larger community of God's good creation. As I breathe in and breathe out, I found myself needing a community like this because I became very, very sad. And yet at the same time, I, I'm holding on to a kernel of hope about what it means to be the body of Christ then and what it means to be the body of Christ in our day and age. How we as a body of Christ for each of us, how we can be present when we or someone we know finds themselves confronted with very deep spiritual angst or concerns or anger or yearnings or doubt about what it means to be 
a follower of Jesus the Christ. Because in this story, what we have is a young man, I'm suggesting he was pretty young, who heard about the story of Jesus, got excited in this new movement, offered to serve. All he was asked to do really was help distribute the, the food or the needs to the, the widows within part of the community, those who were poor among them, help to serve as we continued to ask others in our community to serve, to reach out to the community. And what he is confronted with is, in his new experience, confronted with telling truth to power. And at the same time being dealt with unjustly and dishonestly. And through this, he remains graceful and faithful. Even to the point of as he as he is actually being killed, stoned. If you can, you know, if we had a teleprompter, I might throw out these images of what it means to be killed by stoning. That even as he is being killed, he finds within him, as he focuses on the risen Christ, saying, don't hold this against them. Please forgive them. And then we are believed to think that he somehow died with a sense of peace. In the early church, to be a follower of Jesus meant risking your life for decades, even for a century or so. It was risky. You could lose your life if you committed to this new way of being that was presented by Jesus the Christ and empowered by God, as we soon will experience the season and the events of Pentecost. Today, in our day, and for hundreds of years, my sense is that the church, we become a bit complacent. Members of the congregation, and not, this is not true with every member or with every expression of the Christian faith, but we've come somewhat complacent. And sometimes we are afraid to be faithful or we just choose not to fight back, if you will. Or we allow the fighting back. We allow violence to occur when we want to vent frustration or if we want to hurt our enemies. Humanity has continued to do that, even with the story of Jesus. I mean, it's, it's all over the place. I mean, I don't even have to think about the news in the last couple of, of, of weeks that we've heard so much violence that is happening, and we almost become numb to it. And it's, there's a ton of us who are people of faith in this country even. Now, my concern is, is that we have been complicit. Once the church became, and this was mostly in Europe, became the center of power, it didn't choose to follow the path of Jesus. It chose to claim that, that human sense of violence to control the centers. We know the church not only had crusades going to battle other people and kill other people, we know that the, the church, the authority, also silenced any critics by putting them to death. So here we have the story of Jesus' nonviolence, and we have Stephen restating the whole story as a way of our lives, and yet we as a church or our institution has been very comfortable using violence to quell others. And it's somewhat understandable. I mean, if I have my own traditions, if I have my own ways, and as we heard in the story with Stephen, those who stoned him, Stephen was saying, hey, the way you're doing it, it hasn't been focused on God. Like throughout all the ages, the prophets and those who've gone before Moses, you've, you've missed the point. God is not isolated to a building or a controlled mass. God is God will be where God will want to be. Well, it talks earlier about how 
many of those early converts were lower level, lower level priests because again, Stephen was presented to the same council Jesus was, the same high priest. That's how we understand this story. And they said, man, you're, you're talking about my job. If you want to change the system, you're talking about me being out of a job. I mean, that's what was being presented by Stephen saying, hey, the way it's happened, these institutions, they can't, they can't contain God. God is too big. God is about much more than what you're trying to do. And that was the story. Nothing new within the prophets of the tradition of, of Israel. And Jesus was bringing that focus out for all people, and we hear Stephen living into it. And what happens? Well, it's uncomfortable. And my sense is that we in the church, and this is just me speaking, and you might have a very different opinion. But we as Lutherans, we, we tend to try to rationalize, get our head around a lot of this stuff, and find ways to make sense of it. Has anyone ever heard of the, uh, the Luther's two kingdom doctrine in your Bible studies and your theology studies? Well, back 500 years ago, the way to make sense of a lot of this is that Martin Luther wrote this wonderful treatise about there's this kingdom of God and there's this kingdom of man. And the kingdom of man we're supposed to engage in humans, but, you know, we've got leaders, and we've got politicians, and we've got states, and, you know, God is involved there, but it operates one way. But as the kingdom of heaven, it's about grace and law and getting a sense of how we live with each other, but, you know, it operates kind of differently. So all of a sudden, different from, I think, what the writer of Luke had in mind, here we could come to our worship centers and be connected with God and then go out the front door and then join the military or a group of people who might look to the ground and pick up a stone when they see or they hear of somebody who isn't in step with the overall plan and violently react. Within our faith tradition, we do have those who are nonviolent. We know of the Quakers, we know of even within the Lutheran community, there are those who are Lutheran who will not join the military. I suspect, this is me speaking, we could argue about this differently, but you know, they might be more in tune with the spirit of Jesus and Stephen than I was when I was in ROTC. Because I was ready to go out and say, you know, I'm a good Lutheran, but I can also get my tags for being a you know, a marksman because I'll be ready to shoot the enemy. So we found a way to placate much of how we see life. That's my opinion. Because if we took this understanding of what we hear in Easter reading and hear what Stefan is all about, I think we'll be challenged to look more closely at ourselves and how we, how we find ways to disagree with each other. How governments, how individuals, how groups can overcome their fear of trying to protect what they have and find ways to non-violently find ways to live with each other and live life fully together. Okay, the problem, and this is what I would like to pray for, I'd like to pray that Jesus would come back right now on the sunny, sunny day, no more environmental issues, no more fear, no more striving to get up on each other, that wholeness and peace and a full life for all people would be present. The challenge with that, I suspect, is, is that as we read scripture, if God invited humanity to reflect the divine, who God is, and this notion of that we have the freedom to choose or not to choose, my gut says that. God says, you know, I gave it all to you already. Here's Jesus, the Son, told you how to live fully with each other right here. All you have to do is live into that and know the Spirit of God is with you and do it together. 
it won't be easy, but I've laid it all out. If I come in and do it, then you don't have any freedom. Then it's on me picking up where you guys have dropped the ball. That's my a little zealous way of talking about that. God says, hey, I love you. I've invited you to, to follow Jesus and to reclaim life and know that I'll always be with you. So if Jesus says to me, or God says to me, you guys, come on, grow up. Risk your life together for what you dream about. Love and wholeness and shalom, salvation for all. Okay, so as we gather here, my sense that you have has a challenge as you look forward as the congregations. We as a church as a whole also have a challenge, and that is how are we present in this time in this place? How are we present for the young Stevens and the young Stephanies? that get excited about the message of Jesus. Of life lived fully and wholly for each other, but a life that risks confronting powers, confronting the evils of the world, standing up, naming it, claiming God at your side, and yet at the same time being willing to lose your life over it. And as Jean addressed, and being able to say to those who are hurting you, who've messed with your life, who've dealt with you unjustly, and saying to them and to all those who will hear, God, please forgive them and die knowing that you're living into the life of Christ. That to me is really heavy and to me would be a huge challenge, but there are many and those who will follow us, who will get excited about this life and then wonder, well, why is all this crap still happening? Well, let me suggest to you that what we can do, I suspect, as Jesus offered to those who are on the road to Emmaus, as Jesus continues to offer us with the power of the Holy Spirit, is to be present with each other as a community. So when we as individuals, or when a younger one or an older one feels this angst, we may not have the answers, but what we can do is be present with them. I've known way too many people, pastors primarily, who want to provide all the answers. There are people here that are older than me and my sense is the older we get, the more we know we don't have answers for everything. But what we can offer each other is our, our presence. To sit, to be, and to not deny the deep angst or the anger, the fear, and help folks as a community to hold on to the hope of love for all and the hope that the community, not just individual saints, not just the Martin Luther Kings, not just the Stevens, that the community as a whole will embrace God's power and have the courage to stand up to the violence and to the fear that is so rampant in our own lives as humans and our larger community of humanity. So, on this day, beyond Lynn Anderson's song. I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. I would invite this community of faith, as all communities of faith, to focus on our breathing, knowing that we are human and we're frail and we're fearful and we act in really bad ways and too often we will pick up stones. And to hold that up and not deny it, lament it, ask for forgiveness, and at the same time, hold up the hope of God's love made known in Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, for us now and for all people. And it may not happen in our lifetimes, but we look to the long game, when all will be one, 
in the bosom of God for the well-being of the entire creation and all of humanity. So, if you had your yoga mats here, I'd invite you to join me in the yoga exercise. Breathing in and breathing out. Three times in and three times out. Breathing in. Breathing out. Breathing in. Breathing out. Breathing in. Breathing out. Amen. Risen Lord, on behalf of the community of Redeemer Lutheran and Grace Lutheran, and on behalf of all the Stevens and all the Stephanies, we offer these prayers of love on behalf of the church, on behalf of your creation, and our fellow creatures, ourselves, and our neighbors. God of all, even from the days of the early church, at times we overlooked the needy and vulnerable among us. We pray that you will keep us mindful of others' needs amid our many competing concerns, focusing on spreading the justice of your gospel. God of wisdom, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord of all creation, lead us to use the abundant resources you have blessed us with to strengthen, protect, and build up communities countries, rivers, and oceans. Guide us in our mission to embrace our brothers and sisters around the world and all your creatures, seeking connections and providing for their needs. God of wisdom, hear our prayer. Healing God, give us courage to speak out in the face of injustice and opposition. Provide places of shelter where people can be safe. Protect those who are physically, emotionally, and spiritually unwell. Heal the sick in body, mind, and soul, especially those on our prayer lists and those whom we name in our hearts. God of wisdom, hear our prayer. Incline your ear to our prayers and fill us with power to begin living out our faith courageously by the power of your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And as Jesus prayed and has taught us to pray, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 
through this life, down our paths, Jesus walks with us. Go in peace, for you have found life through Jesus Christ our Lord. May glory be to God the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we close wishing all to have a blessed week and to appreciate the time and energy as we share it in our worship service and as we together continue the soul of the words of Easter blessing. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia.